I recently had a guest on the podcast who stated, there is no free lunch with prostate cancer treatment. The challenges we face with treating prostate cancer lie within the resultant potential harms of therapy, including effects on urinary control and sexual function. We are constantly looking to improve and hone our craft. September is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month, and to kick it off today, I'm excited to be talking about a potential option that has fewer side effects when compared to traditional therapies. You won't want to miss this one. So the big question is this, how can men and those who care for them better educate themselves regarding prostate health, the conditions that affect the prostate, and the latest technology in managing these conditions? That is the question, and this podcast will provide the answers. On a weekly basis, we'll be chatting with experts, innovators, and leaders in the field of urology, sharing useful information with the general public to improve their lives and increase their overall health. My name is Dr. Garrett Pullman, and welcome to the Prostate Health Podcast. Prostate Health Podcast is for informational purposes only. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as medical advice. By listening to the podcast, no physician-patient relationship has been formed. For more information and counseling, you must contact your personal physician or urologist with questions about your unique situation. I'm very excited to have on the show today prostate cancer expert, Dr. Scott Egner from the University of Chicago Medicine. His area of interest and expertise is taking care of men who have been diagnosed with prostate, kidney, or testicular cancer, or are at high risk of being diagnosed with the disease. He is a urologic oncologist experienced in robotic and open surgery. He is co-director of the University of Chicago Medicine High Risk and Advanced Prostate Cancer Clinic, a program that provides focused care for men at risk for prostate cancer and those with advanced disease. His research, which has really resulted in over 250 publications, exclusively focuses on urologic cancers and primarily focuses on improving the screening and care of men with prostate cancer. Dr. Egner, welcome to the Prostate Health Podcast. Great to be here, Dr. Pullman. Thanks for having me. So Dr. Egner, so far on the Prostate Health Podcast, we've had episodes covering surgery and radiation for prostate cancer, which for our listeners is essentially treating the entire prostate gland. Now you and I both treat men with prostate cancer, and I think it's safe to say that urologists are constantly honing our craft and looking toward new advances in treating men with prostate cancer. Now with those new advances, I'm excited to really chat with you today about targeted focal therapy. So can you describe exactly what is a focal therapy? Happily. So surgery and radiation treat the entire prostate. Historically and commonly, that's what's been done for treatment of newly diagnosed localized prostate cancer. Nowadays, many men safely do surveillance, which is the other end of the spectrum, just monitoring things. And the concept of focal therapy is to treat just the part of the prostate that has the meaningful cancer. And it's quite analogous to a lumpectomy for breast cancer. Historically, all women had a radical mastectomy. Through a bunch of large clinical trials and investigators and brave women, 60 to 80% of women now have a lumpectomy when they're newly diagnosed with breast cancer. And we're trying to sort out whether there are men with prostate cancer when it's limited to one or two parts of the prostate. If we can treat just that part of the prostate, have effective cancer control, and try to minimize the risk of potential short or long-term side effects. So... You know, when looking at targeted focal therapy for men with prostate cancer, who are the best potential candidates for this therapy? Depends who you ask. And as you know, there are some loud voices who think it's crazy to do focal therapy in anyone. The other end of the spectrum are some charlatans, usually with a financial interest where anyone who walks in the door can get a focal therapy. My personal opinion is it's a subset of men who have a cancer that warrants treatment, which in my mind is a Gleason 7 or higher treatment. It's limited to one or two parts of the prostate, either a focal smaller area on one side or perhaps bulkier on one side only. Preferably, you can see it with an MRI. And they're well-versed and well-educated on what we know and what we don't know about focal therapy. And I have never had anyone walk in where I say, you should absolutely do focal therapy. Don't think about anything else. 
I think for some men, it's an option amongst many options and some guys choose to do it. So for our listeners, so again, for the the potential candidates, when you say Gleason 7, again, so the lowest score you can have is a Gleason 6. So you're kind of saying that, you know, for those, you know, you're definitely talking about active surveillance as an option for those individuals and, and those above Gleason's score of seven, so eight, nine, or 10, kind of more as far as the more kind of radical therapy, the surgery and radiation therapy, correct? Absolutely agree. So I explained to guys, we have a goofy system under the microscope, Gleason six to 10, 10 is the highest, six is the lowest. As you and many others might know, we're trying to transform that into gray group one to five. I'm of the mindset that almost all guys with Gleason 6 should strongly consider or do surveillance. It's rare, although we do find some guys with lower volume Gleason 8, 9, or 10. And to your point, I agree with conventional therapies. And I currently think the sweet spot for focal therapy are the guys with Gleason 7 and perhaps some guys with lower volume Gleason 8. Now, what are some of the different technologies currently utilized for focal therapy There is a whole menu, and there's literally about a dozen that are being investigated. The most common ones that people offer are cryotherapy, which is freezing, laser therapy, which is basically administering heat. Probably the most common currently is something called HIFU, high-intensity focused ultrasound, where the ultrasound generates energy. There's something called IRE, which is electroporation, There's people who are evaluating water vaporization and a bunch of others that I won't get into. So what methods are you currently uh, utilizing, you know, in identifying the targeted area to treat with targeted therapy? All guys that I see that are considering active surveillance or focal therapy undergo a three Tesla MRI. We happen to use an endorectal coil because our radiologists swear by it, but that's sometimes optional. They have a targeted biopsy to better map and characterize the prostate and better understand what their management options are, which for some men would be focal therapy. And we also talked about, or you talked about some of the different uh, technologies. Is there one that you currently prefer or do you offer, you know, kind of multiple technologies in, in doing the targeted therapy in your practice? The ones we're currently offering to men outside MRI guided laser ablation where a guy is in the MRI machine, we get a laser tip into the part of the prostate that we want to treat. We can monitor in the MRI temperature throughout the prostate until we ablate the region. One of my partners offers HIFU, typically hemiablation, which means knocking out one side of the prostate, either the left or the right side. And then we've also been involved in a number of clinical trials investigating new focal therapies. And quite frankly, that those are my favorite to offer patients because not only is it potentially beneficial to the patient, there's no cost for the patient, and there's a scientific background to it where we will gather data from large groups of men to better understand whether focal therapy is worthwhile or worthless, who it might be appropriate or inappropriate for. Dr. Egner, you're really giving our listeners some awesome information so far. We're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be right back for more on focal therapy for the prostate. Thanks again for joining us today on the Prostate Health Podcast. If you're enjoying the show today, make sure you visit my podcast website at www.prostatehealthpodcast.com. There you can find show notes to all our episodes. You can also click on our resources tab where you can find links to our trusted partners of the podcast as well as links to books, resources, and products, all of which can help in your journey with either an enlarged prostate or prostate cancer. You can also sign up to receive my free What to Expect guide, which includes checklists of what you need to bring and how to prepare, including what to expect with three different scenarios, including your initial urology clinic appointment, a prostate biopsy, or prostate cancer consultation. Sign up for the free guide on the homepage of www.prostatehealthpodcast.com or access this guide directly at www.prostatehealthpodcast.com forward slash clinic. Now, from a cancer standpoint, you know, in terms of looking for recurrence of disease or progression of disease, How do you like to follow these men after undergoing focal therapy? The way I always explain it to men and I think about it is they get their focal therapy and then they go right back on surveillance. So the backbone is a PSA every six months, usually a finger exam once a year. 
but I try to get every guy to agree to an MRI and a biopsy at one year following treatment based on their baseline characteristics, their treatment response, and what is seen one year following therapy. We then tailor the follow-up at that. So for our listeners, what are some of the potential advantages of focal therapy You know, when we're comparing that to entire gland treatment, such as prostatectomy or uh, whole gland radiation therapy? The hope and the dream and the goal is to effectively treat a meaningful cancer to prevent short and long-term problems from the cancer while simultaneously having a lower risk of potential urinary, sexual, or bowel-related complications. And for many men, that is realized. We do need larger groups of men and comparisons to other forms of management, such as surveillance, or whole gland treatment. And the good news is those randomized trials are planned and will be happening. And that'll be the ultimate data collection to learn more about this process. And when counseling patients about focal therapy, what are some of the risks that you talk about when discussing these options? This sounds lame, but this is exactly how I explain it to them is the risk of side effects with focal therapy are kind of like real estate where it depends on location, location, location. So there are guys with smaller lesions embedded deep within the prostate that are far away from important structures where I tell them there's a really low likelihood of having meaningful side effects. For obvious reasons, I would never tell anyone there's a 0% chance. There's other guys where the lesion we're ablating is near some important structures like their urinary tube, the urethra, or the nerves that are important for erections. And I do my best to estimate the likelihood of them sustaining some form of side effect because of that. Now, in terms of recovery after targeted therapy, walk us through kind of what to expect after undergoing targeted therapy. I'm assuming certainly with it being less aggressive, a little quicker recovery time. Is that, do you agree with that? Yeah, it depends on what type of focal therapy is used, but in general, it's an outpatient procedure. Usually, you don't have any tubes that you go home with, although for certain types of focal therapy, you do need a catheter for a period of time. Typically, you don't need any real pain medications. Some guys will take some ibuprofen or Tylenol for any discomfort. Most guys can return to their normal activities relatively quickly, and that's certainly an attractive element of it, but it obviously needs to be tempered with the bigger ticket, more meaningful outcomes you know, that occur down the road from a cancer-related standpoint and potential side effects standpoint. So is a man burning his bridges, so to speak, down the road by choosing focal therapy as initial therapy, say down the road if they would need to do more you know, aggressive therapy like a prostatectomy, uh, for example? So con- yeah, conceptually, that's a really attractive part of it is that you can do the focal therapy and you still have all the other options in your back pocket for a rainy day. And for many men, that has turned out to be true. And I have treated some men with surgery after focal therapy, and thankfully, things have gone very well. However, it's important to emphasize that's conceptual. And we don't have a large body of data to suggest whether it's safe, smart, and reasonable. And I can tell you anecdotal stories of guys that had focal therapy, got a little cocky, didn't do their surveillance, and by the time their cancer had progressed, yes, things became a little bit more challenging. There are some data sets out there from other institutions where treatment with surgery or radiation can be a little bit more complicated and potentially more side effects. I can tell you that I'm picky about who I offer focal therapy to, and it sounds a little self-serving, but we're very restrictive in who we offer it to. I try to get them into a handshake agreement. They're going to do rigorous follow-up, and so far, so good. We have not been burned, meaning a guy hasn't had destructive side effects or a cancer that has spread elsewhere after initially choosing focal therapy. Well, this really certainly uh, seems like a great concept, you know, really when you look at the potential for less urinary leakage and erectile dysfunction. And you kind of alluded to this uh, earlier on in the interview um, in terms of studies and so forth. But, you know, do you personally think that we're getting closer in terms of supportive data for it to be more widely accepted across the board than it is currently? For those of us that have an interest in it, 
It's a really exciting time because there's a lot of patient interest, which is sometimes legitimate and sometimes, quite frankly, I have to temper their enthusiasm and walk them back on this isn't the holy grail. But there's been a lot of industry support as well in new technologies. And the great news is a lot of them are in the process of planning proper, large, randomized trials of focal therapy versus another form of management in conjunction with the FDA, where we will ultimately have the data that we need. I frequently tell patients and truly feel I don't have a horse in the race. I mean, I'd love for it to be a winner for certain men. But as someone who's done a lot of research in prostate cancer, ultimately, my dream is to find out is this the latest, greatest for certain men? Are there certain men that shouldn't have it? And hopefully we can all learn more about it in the process. Well, Dr. Egner, any final thoughts for our listeners today on the podcast? I would just say if you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, you know, make sure you have a thoughtful, meaningful conversation with someone. Find out, number one, can you do active surveillance? And if not, why? You and I treat a lot of men with prostate cancer, but I can tell you my default option is to look for reasons not to have to do a biopsy, not to have to do treatment. If treatment is warranted, learn about surgery, learn about the different forms of radiation, explore focal therapy, and ultimately make your decision. Well, it's really been a joy getting to chat with you today on the Prostate Health Podcast. You certainly have provided tremendous value today for our listeners. Thank you again for taking time to visit with us today. Thanks a lot, Dr. Pullman. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you again for listening to the Prostate Health Podcast. We would love to have you join our podcast Facebook group at www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Prostate Health Podcast, or just use the Facebook group search function and search for the Prostate Health Podcast and ask to join. We'll see you at the next episode.